I've been meditating on the idea of the ordinary or the normal a lot recently. And there seems to be a lot tied up in this. Um, there's a strong thread that I've noticed in myself and in others that seems to create this conflict or at least tension between what is good and what is normal in one camp and what is interesting in another. And to me, to, 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 my, to, me, to my seeing, this is actually very closely connected with the virtue of humility, which um, on examination, the virtue of humility has nothing intrinsically to do with thinking badly or poorly of oneself, but is entirely about seeing things as they are. And in that sense, humility, the virtue of humility and the quality of sanity are the same thing. So when you are able to not get yourself out of the way, but put yourself in the right place to be able to see things, that is humility. Now there's an additional aspect to the virtue of humility, which I think involves an act of acceptance of things as they are versus merely seeing them because one can see and reject, one can see and, and not believe. So humility, I think, requires both the capacity, the capacity and the willingness to see things as they are. Now, it's necessary to go a step further than to simply say humility is to see things as they are because that tends to move, it seems to me, people into the realm of sort of proposition, propositional equality. And it was interesting seeing some of the feedback from the presentation that I gave at Convivium. There seemed to be this thread of people hearing in what I was saying, this idea that because there's this if not infinite, vast quantity of ways to, vast, vast space of ways to approach an idea or a thing or a person, that they're also valid. They're all equally valid. And that's very far from what I would hold to be the case. Because, well, yes, in a sense. Validity meaning, are they true ways? Yes, there are. there is an infinite number of true ways to approach it, a person, a thing, an idea. Does that mean that they're all equally valuable? And by valuable, I mean effective, effective in moving a person towards the core of that reality. And I would say absolutely not. If anything, those exp those those diff they're the different ways of approaching things. The fun one of the fundamental qualities of them is that they could be arranged in differing capacity to bring you to the truth of a thing. Okay, so that that truth which is which is known by God and seen by God and we're all moving towards. Now what's interesting is that when you start talking in this language, it seems like people tend to pick that up and say, right, okay, what that means is I'm gonna take that whole, you know, I saw it once as a child and now, you know, and now I will see it as an adult sort of mindset that's taken out of some of Paul's St. Paul's epistles and they say I need to reject the I, I need to move past the old ways of seeing things into new ways of seeing things and in that is this notion that if something is new in my my approach to something it's therefore more valuable and that think without considerable examination and discipline is actually a very perilous, I'll say, approach to things. I'd also say that I think it's the fundamental approach that our civilizational cultural thing that people call the West, but really isn't the West that's exported to everywhere, is operating under, which it says that 
The path to shalom is through something new. Turn away from the old things. Find something new. Okay. When you take that and you apply it wholesale, there's a basic, as I see it, a basic mathematical process that happens, which is this. If you have the center, right? We're going to take sort of Peugeotian language of center and margin, okay? The center of things per se remains unchanged. That's why it's a thing, okay? If the center of it changed, it'd be a different thing. So, for instance, family, motherhood, trees, fire, stars, words. If that center changes, it becomes a different thing. Okay, so when you take this idea that your approach to reality comes through newness, and the center of things is stable as such. The primary move that people make is, that, is to marginal interpretations or marginal perceptions of things. I think this is pretty clear. We, when we want to understand what family means, we go out and we say, well, what are all these weird, friend, these fringe permutations of families that we find in other civilizations and other cultures, we need to get away from what, we, what we're used to. We need to see what would it be like if we didn't think of the traditional, say, the traditional nuclear family or something like that. And then, then we're going to gain insight into it. Or um, cuisine, I want to understand food, and so that means I need to try exotic foods and these, you know, these things that are these marginal things and find strange spices and, and, and add them to my food. But the problem is that there's the real center of things, and then there's our perceptual center of things, right? What, what we're used to in terms of perception, okay? And so if we're rejecting, if we're not even rejecting necessarily, but just moving out of, you don't even have to reject the center. If you're just moving out from the center to find something novel, you do that and you end up in the margin, but then the margin becomes your perceptual center. And you've already left the center, so where are you going to go? Well, you're going to have to, you're, you're going to end up in the margin of the margin. And so there's this movement when we feel that, when we think that we're going to find our primary insight into reality by looking at things that are seem new to us. And we do that by looking for strange cases, edge cases, the long tail of stats, you know, exceptions, all of these things. It necessarily mathematically drives us to the margin, and then from the margin to the margin of the margin, from the margin to, of the margin of, to the margin of the margin of the margin, and on out. And instead of coming closer to the truth of things, we've actually moved further away because of this drive for novelty and, and newness. And so this goes back actually to the unfortunately low audio thing that I did on George Bailey's perspective of your catastrophe because there is another option and that other option is to have faith in the unending freshness and depth of the nature of things gk chesterton i'm not going i'm going to gloss this because it's been a long time since i've read it says that we know more about the distant stars about minuscule particles than we do about things like love and death and earth and water. That is the things that are closest to us that we actually know the least about. And I don't think it's simply because we ignore them, but because the things that are closest to us have the greatest depth available, not in the margins, not in the, the weird and the unusual permutations, but in their very core. So, for instance, there's a wonderful place in the Liturgy of the Holy Week in the traditional Western Catholic Rite where there's a, a blessing of water, of the water. There's a, it's, it's, it's the special holy water. And the priest in the liturgy addresses the water as the waters that were there at the beginning of creation, um, the waters that 
that, that Moses, that parted from Moses and the Israelites to pass through. So the water, there's water in a basin in a church building, you know, in rural Arkansas, or in Italy, or in, in Indonesia, wherever this liturgy is taking place. The, you are the water that sprang out of the rock in the desert. You're the water that baptized our Lord. Right? You're the water that sprang from his side when he was pierced to the lance. Do you know water? Do you think you know water? Think again. And so that is the humble approach to reality. Not one that says to know, I need to go out into the weird and the unusual. That's fine, sometimes. So long as it's always with the goal of coming back to the heart of things. To know that our home is not in the margin, but in the center. And so then we come to things like the central Christian mysteries of the Incarnation and the Trinity. And we're apt to look at those, I think, and say, these are mysteries beyond us. I shouldn't even speak of them. Because how can words touch this? You know, how, can, how can a mystery be, be spoken of or defined? And I think here again, humility, the virtue of humility, would take us by the hand and say, What a child would do is he would take he or she would take the words given to them and trust not that we know what the mystery means or that the mystery is one to be solved like a like an Agatha Christie murder mystery or like some scientific investigation, but as the richest fount of understanding to be poured forth to us from that same and undiminishing center and say, no, it's not that you understand the mystery, that you can speak of it, that you don't understand the words. Gerard Manley Hopkins in uh, his poem, God's Grandeur finishes by saying, for all this nature is never spent, there lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last light off the black west went, O oh morning on the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with awe bright wings. So when we wake up and we find ourselves in a world that seems to be trodden down and overrun with just with pure gray ordinariness, there's a call to lift up our eyes, to see where our help comes from. And that is that God himself is brooding over creation and bringing forth that dearest freshness that's there for those who are humble enough to pick up again and again and again the things that are given properly for man food and drink sunshine fresh air love family gratitude trees if we don't if we can't conceive of an internal state that could be in such a relation to the common things of life that we are filled with gratitude, with, with a Eucharistic spirit, with a spirit of thanksgiving. If we can't do that, if we can't stand in a place of thanksgiving to God because of the way that we see ordinary things, we will push the button of novelty until the whole world is torn to pieces. So, what does that mean? It means say your prayers, go to church, don't 
feel this drive for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, the sin of curiositas. It's, it's so deep in us now. It's not to say accept boredom, but to identify the source of boredom, not as a failure of your circumstance to manifest sufficient interest, but in our own acquiescence to blindness, willful, sometimes, sometimes unconscious acquiescence to blindness, to the depths of reality that surround us. This is why with something like the, the rosary devotion, I meditate day after day after day on the same mysteries of the incarnation of our Lord. Pray the same prayers over and over and over because I have faith that I have not even begun to plumb their depths, that I can turn back to them again and again, find fruitful life, fruitful insight, that delight in truth that we so often shortcut by finding, trying to find the novel that feels like insight, but doesn't move us anywhere. So spice is fine. It's fine as a little bit. But our bread, our butter, our meat, and our drink must be the common everyday things of life and the endless meditation on the mystery of the Holy Trinity and the Incarnation of Christ. Thank you.